Hi, everyone, and welcome to Cambridge Drive Community Church's online worship service for February 20th, if you can believe we're almost at the end of February already. Um, I'm Pastor Nicole Quinto, and I am going to be walking with you today through our Old Testament reading, our New Testament reading, and a message. So if you have your Bibles out, please turn to Genesis 45, and then maybe put a little bookmark in. We're also going to be covering some verses in Luke 6. So I'll let you know specifically what verses when we go over it. Just have that ready. You can follow along. So the first reading we have for today is Genesis 45, and we're going to be reading verses 1 through 15. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. So this is Joseph reveals himself to his brothers. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried out, send everyone away from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it and the household of the Pharaoh heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him. So dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh the Lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen and you shall be near me and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds, and all you have. I will provide for you there since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. And now your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my own mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father how greatly I am honored in Egypt and all that you have seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, while well, Benjamin wept upon his neck. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. And our second reading from today is Luke 6. We're following along in the Revised Common Lectionary. This is going to be Luke 6, 27 through 38. Love for enemies. But I say to you that listen, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you, and if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? 
Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies. Do good and lend expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your father is merciful. And on judging others. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. This is the gospel of our Lord. And may God bless this word to us. So today I want to talk to you about, ready for it? Love. How could you guess, right? <laughs> well, I've been reading a lot of sermons lately um, on this passage and as well as the synoptic gospels that deal with this same sentiment of loving your enemies. And one sermon that has stuck out to me in particular is the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's sermon titled, Love Your Enemies. And this is based off of Matthew 5, 43 through 48. And as far as I know, you could find this online. So I would strongly suggest that you take a look at that if this is something that really resonates with you because it really influenced uh, my synthesis of the, the text and my understanding of what it means to love your enemies. So check that out. So getting to our message, the words of today's gospel are great words, but they're also difficult words. Over the centuries, many people have argued that to love your enemies is an extremely difficult, if not impossible, command to put into practice. And I will admit, on many days, I have been one of them. There is hope in this thought, however. I believe Jesus realized that it's hard to love your enemies. He realized that it's difficult to love those who seek to defeat you, those who say evil things about you. He realized that it was painfully hard, but he really meant those words. Um, the reading from Genesis mirrors the message of Jesus and probably helped inform his own teachings. And of course, this is that pivotal scene in the Joseph story, one of the most by one of the Bible's most vivid dramatizations of mercy. Sold by his brothers into Egyptian slavery, Joseph eventually becomes one of the highest officials in Pharaoh's government. And at long last, he comes face to face with his brothers and they don't even recognize him in this new role. We cannot dismiss these passages as exaggerations to get a point across. Because the principle of loving your enemy is a basic tenet of the Christian gospel, and we should take it seriously. And as we do, we will discover that more powerful words have not been spoken. These words are life-giving, life-changing, and they will give us peace and joy even in the midst of strife. So the first question we need to ask is, how do we actually love our enemies? What does it look like in practice? Summing it up, Jesus puts it this way. Love your enemies, do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. This last idea of expecting nothing in return is key to the whole thing the whole series of, of thoughts here, Jesus challenges his listeners to love not as a strategy for gain, a quid pro quo kind of relationship, but rather for the sake of love itself. So we also need to understand that there is this element of good in 
every person, even those who act like our enemies. Every time negative and hateful thoughts enter into our minds towards those people, we can remember that there is some good about that person and look for it. For God created every one of his children in God's own image, and everybody is beautiful in the eyes of God, the mother of us all. So secondly, we need to realize that there is something within all of us that causes us to cry with the Apostle Paul in Romans 7.15. He says, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Even within the best of us, there are things that we see and we do not like. And within the worst of us, there is something good. When we come to see this balance, we can take a different attitude towards individuals who are just as flawed as we are. We can take a different attitude about judging and judgment. So when we come to the point where we can look in the face of every person and see deep down within them this image of God, we begin to love them regardless because we can see God's image in their heart. Another way that you can love your enemy is this. When the opportunity presents itself for you to defeat your enemy or get even, you must not do it. There will come a time in many instances when the person who hates you most, the person who has misused you most, the person who has gossiped about you the most, the person who has spread these false rumors about you the most, there will come a time when you will have an opportunity to defeat that person. And that's the time you must not do it to shame them, to open them up for public ridicule, for love, is seeking the goodwill for all people. Love is the refusal to defeat any individual. When you rise to the level of love, you seek only to defeat sin and sinful attitudes, but not the person. And when you can rise to love on this level, you begin to love people not necessarily because they are likable to you, but because God loves them. However, like any great teaching, this one is vulnerable to a disastrous distortion. The call to offer the other cheek, for example, or to forgive or lend without return can be misconstrued to prohibit withdrawing from abusive situations. But this confuses love with passivity. True love acts to end abuse primarily for the sake of the abused, but also for the sake of the abuser who harms themselves as well as their victim. So thus, holding abusers accountable in love is not only consistent with loving our enemies, but an expression of it. Accountability is so important. Loving our enemies does not mean giving up love for ourselves and some weird self-righteous sacrifice. It means that we treat others with the respect that we would demand for ourselves, and we treat ourselves the same. So the greatest commandment, which we will get to in the coming weeks in Luke 10, to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves, this one commands us to demand respect for ourselves. We can't force someone else to respect or love us, but we can darn well love ourselves. And sometimes that does mean removing ourselves from a situation or relationship that is abusive. In such a case, we can wish that person well. We can pray for them. We can love them from a distance if that's what we need to do to keep ourselves safe. But we do need to forgive them so that we can move forward, so that 
that kind of hate is not poisoning our own soul. We can help them when and if appropriate. We can refuse to defeat them, to win or get even. But we are not commanded to be anyone's punching bag. This is not what Jesus is saying. We are not commanded to allow ourselves to get to that point to become an enemy of ourselves. I suppose if we do get to that point where we don't love ourselves or demand that kind of respect for ourselves and we become that enemy, what do we do with an enemy? Well, we love them, of course. So we really do not have any excuse not to prioritize loving ourselves. So please keep that in mind. This, where we're at right now, this is when it becomes necessary for us to know not only how to love our enemies, but understand why we should love them. So the first reason, and I think this was at the very center of Jesus's thinking is this, that hate for hate only intensifies the existence of hate and evil in the universe. So if I punch you and then you punch me and then I punch you back and then you punch me back, that goes on forever. And that is the tragedy of the cycle of hate. It doesn't stop. It only intensifies and leads to destruction and pain. Somebody must have sense enough and morality enough to cut off the chain of hate and the chain of evil. That is what we are called to do as Christians, and we can only do that by the power of love. And what do we call this kind of love, this completely free and above and beyond kind of love, giving? We, we call it grace. Grace. We may think of grace primarily as the unearned saving love of God, the redemptive love of God. But at the same time, this is exactly the kind of love Jesus calls us to live out. Not as gods or angels, but as children of the Most High, human beings created in God's image. And when we love this way, we embody the Imago Dei the image of God. This is the love we were made for, extending unending grace to ourselves, extending grace to others. And when we live this way as children of God, everything fits. We don't condemn others. God doesn't condemn us. We live in the image of the God of love. Likewise, we forgive others. God forgives us. We live in the image of the God of mercy. We give and receive not because we need some fair exchange, but rather because we live in the image of God, the abundant giver. So to no credit of our own, but merely and marvel marvelously as God's beloved child, do we do these things. And if we can look at it this way, Jesus is more like a playful artist painting these beautiful, provocative pictures of love, these practical icons that we can embody every day. For God is kind to the ungrateful, gracious to the ungracious, and we are made in God's image. And accordingly, with the Spirit's help, grace is bubbling up all around us all the time. And if we can stay alert, we'll notice it everywhere. So do you see how Joseph doesn't condemn, but rather comforts his brothers? Jesus doesn't condemn, but rather prays for his persecutors, even near the end of his life when he knows he's going to be treated without justice. And our everyday lives too, full as they are of struggles and coats and loans and curses, may also be full of love, mercy, and full of grace. There is a power. And this kind of gracious love that our world as a whole has not discovered yet. But there is hope because Jesus discovered it centuries ago. And most people never discover it if they believe in an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. 
if they believe in hating for hating. But Jesus comes to us and says, that is not the way. And I believe with all my heart that through the power of this love that Christ is teaching us, even some people that choose to hate will be transformed. We will be able to change the world with the redemptive power of love that reaches out even to our enemies and blesses though, bless those that curse us. For darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hatred cannot drive out hatred. Only love can do that. And that is the power of Christ's love. It overcomes all. And that is such good news. That is grace in action. Amen. I hope you will stick with me for just a moment more so I may bless you as you go out into the world and continue your day. This is adapted from a prayer by Margaret A. Davidson. Blessings upon you, upon those you love and those you shall never know. Blessings upon your steps and upon the vision of your eyes. Blessings upon you in all circumstances, joy and sorrow, for wisdom rests in them, twin experiences with different faces. Blessings be upon what lies before you, the challenges and decisions, the pain and the relief. Blessings upon you, my friends in Christ, my beloveds. Now go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen.